Hey, so my podcast, Leo Martin. What's going on? Woo! Another day, another dot. Oh my god, I'm right on the clock. Look, look at it. ten o'clock exactly. Wednesday, fifteenth February, twenty twenty-three. Wow, yeah. Look at that. Right on the clock. Training myself. Okay, so today's show. Hope you've all had a nice day. Have a nice day. I didn't you know I've done I feel like I've done nothing, but I've done quite a lot. So I must be doing it right. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, got the show today. It was kind of inspired about inspired by a couple of things, but just the chats mostly with other people and listeners and stuff. So there's a kind of listener inspired show this one today. So this is gonna be what was it, number of episodes what are we on? We're on seventeen, eighteen now? Oh, I've done so many. I've wrote a load of shows today. So, anyway. Yeah, today, bonkers batteries and the race to zero. This inspired one today. This is about, because uh, the energy crisis and the current situation. I'm wondering about um, the technologies. As, as, uh, the energy technologies has always been one of the things that don't seem to keep up with everything else. I mentioned this a few times, a lot of places. But energy systems are so prominent. It's such a big thing. In our costs, in the, the infrastructure, and in, in I've always found it quite curious that they don't seem to be moving forward in pace of everything else. Right. And so, uh, recently, I've, you know, getting solar, got this garden, looking at ways to try and save money with the energy thing. So I'm personally paying a premium, prepayment meters, smart meters, all that. So it's, it's tough. So I've, I've you know, looking, been looking at tough solar and things and, and batteries. And then I'd seen this this video I was talking to me about um, Chance actually a friend called Chance talking about how I'd seen this thing uh, sand batteries. Oh, what a sand battery! And I've seen it with reference to using them to store electricity to heat them up using these heaters. Well, that could be really handy for me. But then, you know, what else? What else we got? So yeah, I thought I'll have a look. See what else, see what else is um in there with the funky batteries, because that sounds bonkers to me, right? <laughs> bonkers battery, sand battery. So I thought, well, have a look, see what, see what innovations there actually are, because I say there don't seem to be any coming. I recently had the Lawrence Livermore Lab announcement that they've achieved fusion. So it's, oh, you know, it's always, oh, it'll be five years, whatever. But I don't know, we need energy now. I don't know about you, but cost is getting stupid. We need it right now. So. Anyway, so I'll have a look into that, see what, because uh, it's a ludicrous energy crisis. For me, in my opinion, call, I think it can qualify it as well. It's been caused by poor decisions, suppression, and greed. And many people are, like I say, looking for cheaper alternatives. So I want to have a look at, see what uh, solutions and innovations there might be with regarding storing renewable energy that we might be able to use ourselves. So to begin, let's start first, which actually is a real beginning, a true beginning for this show and for me and, and all sorts, because we'll go first to the first battery, obviously. I'll start there if we're doing batteries, and for me, it's a Baghdad battery. But for me, the Baghdad battery was one of the places that uh, got me out of the matrix, ah, sort of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, Baghdad battery. It's what it was for me. Crystal schools. I had this, I'd seen this documentary about crystal schools advertised when I was a youth. I never saw it, missed it. It's on too late. I forgot about it. Years later, I got a book for someone for the birthday. When I was at the bookstore, I was just drawn to this area. And I seen this glowing orange book. It's a really bright spine on it. I was like, what's that? And I whipped it out and had the crystal schools on the front. It was a crystal school book. I was like, oh my God, that's the one from the documentaries. You know, that was the study, the research. So yeah, it gets that. And yeah, that's what triggered me off discovering this stuff. Because I had this and YouTube had been around about a year. And I thought, oh, I'll check this YouTube thing out. See if I can find the documentary on these crystal schools. And I watched it. I had this book. I was watching it. I was like, oh my God. And then the next one was a, like a kind of ancient aliens. It wasn't ancient aliens, but it was written, uh, Jason Martell talking about the Baghdad battery. You know, and then it was the video after that. My second video on YouTube, looking at it properly, was uh, uh, Phil Schneider after looking at the Baghdad battery. So that was that was my beginning. <laughs> it was baptism of fire. Anyway, yeah, let's have a look then. Baghdad battery. For those of you who are not familiar... 
there's a picture of this. Baghdad, there was a battery found, Baghdad, two, uh, 250 BC, really, really old. Uh, so there's a picture for people on the video. I'll just uh, sort of read through it. So yeah, basically this battery, this Baghdad battery is believed to be about 2,000 years old from the Parthian period, roughly two, uh, 250 BCE to CE 250. The jar was found in Kujut Rabu, just outside Baghdad, and is composed of a clay jar with a stopper made of asphalt. And sticking through the asphalt is an iron rod surrounded by a copper cylinder. And when filled with vinegar, is that electro, uh, electrolytical solution, but it's basically it is, say acid, you know, vinegar's acidy. And you might have done it at school where you can get electric from a lemon, get a charge. So the acidity is what's doing it. So yeah, vinegar, yeah, create electrical charge. And the, the jar produces 1.1 uh, volts. So I say 12 volt battery, just stack 12 of them on, 12 volt battery. You know, you stack uh, 24, 24 volt battery. If you're in par parallel, you can have a bigger reservoir, um, a bigger charge. If you do them in series, you can have a bigger reservoir. And that's how it works with, um, you know, the old, if you create a solar system, it, de it depends that it's always cheaper to have higher voltage. You know, it's scalable up better because, you know, the cabling has to be thinner. Because if you have a lower voltage, the amps go up and, you know, you have to have thicker cables. So most people do, uh, in, in a van or a car, often that stuff's 12 volt. So people use 12 volts, it's just easier. You don't need that much, it's not like powering a home. But anything more than that, on 24 volts or 48 volts, because then it reduces the ampage, you get more for your money. Cable don't have to be as thick, sort of thing. So yeah, little quick electronics there. So yes, bad battery, first battery. Yeah, old, about 2,000 years old, the same. And this is from one of the most trusted sources in archaeology, uh, Smith, uh, edu, I think that's Smithsonian Institute, one of the most trusted names in all of archaeology. So, yeah, that's, that's a nice article. So, let's, yeah, so let's start with a Baghdad battery. So, right then, we've got that. But then, like I say, I've seen people talking about uh, making sand batteries. And what struck me with that one is that that's not, that can't happen, surely. You can't make a sand battery because, I mean, yeah, I think thinking of Iraq, thinking about that battery, yeah, I think there's plenty of sand in Iraq, but I don't think of that as making a connection to making a battery, making a connection, because sand's an insulator. It's a rubbish conductor of electric, I thought. But then I remember Eric von Dineken talking a weird stuff, saying that, you know, uh, we got an electrical reading from the Nazca lines. So I always found that quite baffling. So, but sand is a good heat conductor. But how can it be a battery? I don't know. But then, I, having looked into this, found that it's not just people making them. It's there's a in, there's a Finnish company. It's got industrial size sand batteries, that, which is basically for dumping uh, wind power when you got excess. It's basically for excess dumpage. So, <laughs> sand batteries are a thing. On an industrial level, but no way. I was just thinking maybe I could store some extra energy or make a heater, but no. So let's check this out. So this is from a company, uh, Polonite Energy. We've got a sand battery. Yeah, let's read the article. So what is a sand battery? That's what I want to know. That's probably what you know now, considering I've presented the question. <laughs> a sand battery is a high temperature thermal energy storage that uses sand or sand-like materials as its storage medium. It stores energy in sand as heat. Oh, okay. Ah, now it makes more sense. I'm just just hit me now. Now it makes sense thinking about it because there's there's solar power from uh, PV, or is it photovoltaic, where you're getting an electrical volt from the sun hitting it. But then you got other solar systems where it's the heat of the sun that's producing the power. So there's a different, yeah, so one's just, yeah. So there's two types of kind of solar for doing that. One's using the heat, one's using the light, the photons itself. So, yeah, okay, there's a heat one. Okay, going the heat method. Okay. Yeah, and it's still energy, it's just converting it, I suppose. Hmm, okay. And you lose 
energy with electricity in heat. So maybe we can turn the heat back to electric, right? Okay, so sand battery is a high temperature thermal energy storage that uses uh, sand or sunlight materials as a storage medium. Okay, it stores it as heat. Its main purpose is to work as a high powered, uh, high capacity reservoir for excess wind and solar energy. The energy is stored as heat. It can be used to heat homes or provide hot steam and high temperature process heat uh, to industries that are often fossil fuel dependent. Oh, okay, okay. It's not converted into electric, sounds like. As the world shifts towards higher and higher renewable uh, fractions, the electricity production, yeah, we need more renewables then. People do more and more. The, uh, the intermittent nature of these energy sources causes challenges to energy networks. Yeah, because you can't guarantee the power. Sometimes you get too much and you can't use it. It gets wasted. That makes sense. The sand battery helps uh, to ambitiously upscale renewable production by ensuring there's always a way to benefit from clean energy, even if the surplus is massive. So that's the thing. That's the thing. If you get a winter, even a uh, domestic like wind turbine, it's probably less than 500 watts, probably not, not put much point unless you've got a really windy place because I think they need a... They need a certain. I think the wind speed's got to be at least ten mile an hour or something for them to get started. But anyway, if you get wind generators, wind turbines, they will. They, they have to have a charge controller. Same with solar. So when the electricity is coming in, because it's intermittent, when you're charging things, batteries and stuff, you you want it to go steady. So you have to have a charge controller in between, and it will grab the intermittence and level it out and charge it up. So if you imagine a, a bicycle dynamo, you used to go as dynamos, it will pedal. The faster you pedal, the brighter it goes. Right, the less you pedal, it goes off. So it's kind of the kind of rubbish because you've got to be pedaling at a consistent speed to get a consistent amount of light. You know, so pedaling up a steep hill in the middle of the night, you're not going to get any light sort of thing. But going downhill in the middle of the day, it's going to be blasting light. So, so these days, modern light uh, bicycles will have a hub, dynamo hub, but it's got a kind of charge controller built in, so you can plug your devices straight into it. So you'll have a wire going through the back of your bike wheel hubs, picking up electric somewhere along the way is charge controller, which allows you to then just, you know, have it popping through a little bag where you've got your phone in, so it can just get charged as you cycle. But without that charge controller, it don't work. So with the wind, what it's referring to here is that. Yeah, sun's one thing, you're getting so much energy. And it's going to be, you know, and it will drop on and off, you know, with the clouds and the day's falling off. So it's relatively steady. But with wind, it could just be sudden and then gone, isn't it? And so you can get massive amounts of power from turbines. So wind turbine generators, their charge controllers, it's not this isn't in the article, I just want you to not understand it works. Because they can get so, like, a lot at once, suddenly. They have to have a dump load. So it can go somewhere so it don't fry things. So in the way that is usually laid out, at least in the commercial ones, if you go and buy a wind turbine and uh, a charge controller for it, it will have a, like a printed circuit board it's doing your charge controller, and then it will have a kind of cylinder of just ceramic, like a big fat sausage of ceramic, and it's got knobbly bits spilling around it. It's just extra ceramic, and it's just to create a stupid amount of resistance. So if there's too much power going through, it will dump it in that ceramic, knowing that no matter how much power is going through, it's just going to get, it's never going to be able to bridge the gap because it's a non conductor. It's going to really force its way through. You know, it's just going to, and it's ceramic. So it will do is just heat it up, but it's ceramic, so it can take it. So that's that's how they work. And, and suppose if, so if you think of that on a massive scale, do you know what I mean? Whereas I might be, if I got one, I might be, you know, losing 100 watts. You know, so oh, no, dump it's gone overrated. I'm losing 100 watts, but with these, man, these are kilowatts, aren't they? There's a lot of dump energy. And the same problem was, the same issue was when they tried putting a tether. I think it's SDS 75, and that's the one where they put uh, a tether behind a shuttle, miles long, hoping to skim the magnetosphere and pull off some magnetic energy, and then, you know, maybe we can store it, and that's, you know, and somehow deliver it to Earth. But... They got so much, they just fried it. You know, it worked, 
but just too much of it. You can't got to regulate it. So I think that's what we're talking about with these uh, these industrial sand batteries. They 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 basically making where I said it's like a ceramic cylinder. They've just basically got a sand one, but instead of just dumping it in there and letting the heat go away, they're going to capture that heat. So I suppose they've essentially gone inside the little ceramic cylinder that you would have on your on your charge controller, and they've put something in there that will use it. So I suppose we could, if we knew it was getting dumped in all the time, was always hot, we could stick a pipe in there pumping water through, you know, maybe use a heating system, whatever. But I think this is what the, these guys are talking about, sand batteries. But now I'm noticing, actually, <laughs> they've put batteries in inverted commas at the top there, and then in quotation marks down a bit further down. So it's a bit of a, mm, it's, no, it's, it's a bit of a sneaky one. It's not quite an electrical battery, is it? But it's still pretty cool. So, I mean, yeah. And heat, obviously, heating, you know, with your energy costs and that, it'd be great if you could do that. Like, if you had to, if you had a solar system or wind system, and you got, instead of having a dump load, dump it, if you can dump it into sand instead, you know what I'm saying? You could put a fan on top of that, and outlets, and, you know, you've got heat in there. So I'm, I'm considering doing this for my, for my, I'm going to get my polytunnel, so I can keep it heated at night, and it gets uh, cold and stuff, because you need nominal temperatures. So, it's a possible cheap solution, you know what I'm saying? And in fact, I could I could potentially then just have a solar, because I won't need that much. And it's for a greenhouse, like the nominal. You know, I could potentially have something where it's just feeding all the time, a little panel above above it, maybe. So it's always getting some. Plus, I'm thinking about doing the wind turbine myself anyway, as a surplus thing, so, so maybe that's the way forward, you know? But we'll see. There's ways to do it. So there's uh, diesel heaters and stuff coming out that use electric and, and diesel. Anyway, moving on. Weird battery. Weird battery. But, like I say, this is heat. Okay. But, like I said, the Eric Von Dinicum thing, he's getting an electrical current. So, I don't know. Maybe there's something you can do. Anyway, moving on. What else we got then? So, sand battery. That's the industrial stuff. But then I found that looking into batteries in lithium news, the only news show for bipolar disorder. Just kidding. In lithium, no, lithium ion batteries. In lithium news, they're talking about a solid state battery. So if it wants to load. Yeah, lithiumnews.com. A revolutionary solid state battery is nearly here, scientists say. Woo hoo hoo. And it's, uh, I've seen a few articles about this, but yeah. Uh, Quantum Scapes San Jose campus in the heart of Silicon Valley is a buzz with confidence. The battery technology company's QS campus, which includes QS Zero, Quantum Scapes pre pilot production line, and three adjacent buildings, is largely dedicated to manufacturing space. The scale of the campus itself is the company's investment. Each building is under a confirmed 10-year lease as of November 2021. Okay, so they're going for it past the 25th. Uh, signals Quantum Scapes Assurance says that uh, this signals that um, Quantum Scapes Assurance that the company will be the first on the market with solid-state batteries for electric vehicles. Quantum Scape claims that you will be able to buy an Audi or a Volkswagen with its battery as soon as 2024. Wow, it's like next year. Okay, a vehicle that can go nearly 400 miles on a single charge, then recharge in 15 minutes. Ah, that's what I'm saying. So I was impressed with uh, EcoFlow. They got a electric power station that can um, charge up in like a little over an hour for like a, over 400, you know, what hours. Now, usually, like, uh, the American Jacker is quite popular. that take about four or five hours, I think, on mains charge. So to do it in an hour, just over, like, way faster. And I thought that's pretty nifty. So, yeah, the EcoFlow. So I got one of them. But they had lithium-ion. So these newer sort of electric um, generators, they're getting, like, lithium-phosphorus-ion, uh, life, P3, 
Tokyo 4, whatever. So yeah, so lithium uh, ion phosphate batteries are getting popular like in the RV circles. So about this one's here talking solid state. And yeah, I mean, 15 minutes, that's, that's sad because I'm into Nico flow because I've got one. And so I know firsthand, but also so the fastest recharging batteries in the world, at least in the RV, you know, the electrical generator things. So if this is doing it in 15 minutes on a car battery and they're coming next year, what? No, like Eco EcoFly have just changed their chemistry to the new, you know, lithium phosphate ion and bought some new ones out, right? Replaced the series and stuff. And, and the competitors like Bluetti are, are using that chemistry as well because they've got way more charge cycles, like four, five hundred versus, you know, like two, three thousand. The charge cycle being, you know, if it's fully charged, you fully discharge it and charge it up again. That counts as a charge cycle and each battery will have a rating of so many before it starts degrading capacity lose about 20% after that point. So having, you know, thousands of charge cycles instead of 100 means the lifetime of the battery is going to be better. Okay, before it starts losing capacity. Because after a while, batteries deteriorate. And this is talking that it's got um, these solid state ones. It's, yeah. It's saying you can charge them up in 15 minutes. So after... After nearly traveling nearly 400 miles, I mean, imagine that sounds incredible, really, compared to these no good ones you're getting now in these electric generators. That's that's a lot, that's a heck of a lot. How many watt hours is that? To move, it's a motor mover as well. It's a motor mover as well. It's not like you're just charging phones, and that's a big difference. You know, if you're just charging phones, if like if I want to if I want to use a, a drill, a 600 watt drill. With my electric power station, I can do it. It does 600 watt out there. And it can do this magic trickery. It will do up to 1800, even though it's only giving out 600. Right, so do 600 watt. But that's 600 watt on a 500 some watt hour thing. No, you, you, you're not even going to get an hour out of that. However, if you use a battery drill, you charge the battery up for 7 watts. Right? You charge the battery up, my electric generator, for 7 watts. And it charges up pretty quick, like 20, 30 minutes. So it's 7 watts for half an hour. Rather than 600 for an hour. But you still get the same job out of it. You know what I'm saying? Okay, your battery one might not be the full 600 watt. It's enough, though. Or it's about that. It's a good one. Impact driver. You know what I'm saying? It's 7 watts versus 600. So batteries... The way it's efficient, the way you transfer the stuff, you know. So directly moving motors directly from an electric battery, that's asking a lot. So to do 400 mile in an Audi and then charge it up in 15 minutes, that sounds stupid in the battery world. But but that's what we got. Yeah, they're calling them a, you know, I'll just highlight that bit. All, it's, so where have you got lithium ion? It would be um, L-I-O-N. This, this new acronym will be ASSB batteries, so it'll be um, all solid state batteries, which will be the new acronym. It says all solid state batteries promise prolonged life, faster charge times, and safer chemistry compared to lithium ion options because, but producing them on a scale needed to power millions of vehicles won't be easy, despite the billions of dollars already invested in the tech. Companies like QuantumScape are racing. Oh, that's fair enough. Just turn this off again. Just memory wire. Yeah, so, yeah, companies like uh, QuantumScape are racing to reach the market ahead of other battery-focused outfits like Solid Power in Colorado and Prologium Technology in Taiwan. As well as giant automakers like Nissan, as well, they're in on it, and the uh, competition is obviously, you know, that pushes it forward, doesn't it? So, oh, hey, people in the chat. What's up, guys? <laughs> Bonkers candy. <laughs> Bonkers again. I miss Bonkers Happy Hardcore. You remember that? DJ Dougal. DJ Sai. DJ Vibes and the MC Lively. Oh, I miss... Start DJing again soon. Still got the headphones. Anyway. Yes, what's Bobby got to say? Bobby Broadway. Mr. Bonkers Candy from the 80s. Yeah, me too, man. And talk about the 80s, actually, in a bit. Sort of. But anyway, 
they have to prove those batteries work at minus 65. That's another thing. Before I would trust them, electric cars. Yeah, exactly. DG. Champion point there. Yeah, that's another thing. I ain't mentioned that yet. <laughs> ain't got to that. In fact, I didn't think about that because I was just you know, thinking which batteries do electric heat. But yeah, temperature. That was another thing I found out. Even the lithium ion, if they get too cold, they won't, you got to warm them up. <laughs> it not work. It's not that bad. I mean, it's got to go a few degrees below, but yeah, not work. Like I say, minus 60 foot, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not going work. But anyway, yes, yeah, so, yes, yeah, so I don't know, so I stay. I just thought it was a bit crazy with the sand thing. Then it's sand people. Anyway, what else we got? So, there's a, so we've got that one then. I've got a sand battery, a big industrial one. But then we've got, what was this one? I found another one here talking about breakthrough batteries. There's a, another one here that's supposed to be super duper badass. That's going to get us, you know, or a good one. But this one's, uh, instead of, see, the chemistry, that's what does me with the chemistry and stuff. You've still got to do this mining and, like, as uh, DG mentioned, the chemistry, it's important. You know, for, like, environmental concerns later, how you get that stuff, this, that, and the other. And, yeah, and how safe is it going to be? Or uh, is it going to work when you're stuck up in the mountains and it snowed overnight? That kind of stuck, you know. <laughs> it needs to work. But anyway, so, yeah, so, got the sand one. Got a solid state one. They're saying it's a revolution, but then this one here. Got another one. How about this? How about sea salt? Instead of sand? Sea salt. Is that what? Sea salt? Significant breakthrough. The new sea salt battery has four times the capacity of lithium. Wow. Your electronics could soon be powered by an ultra cheap sea salt battery. Researchers have built a new cheap battery with four times the energy storage of lithium. And that sounds pretty good. So what have we got then? Constructed from sodium and sulfur. Demon batteries. Evil demons. But that's okay. It's fine. Just sulfur, innit? This is a chemical, you know. It's a, in fact, sulfur in alchemy, it just represents the body. And that's why they probably associate it with that, because we're beasts in legalese, aren't we? Make us... Mm, it's all word magic, probably. Anyway, digressing. Constructed from sodium sulfur, a type of molten salt that can be processed from seawater, the battery is low cost and more environmentally friendly than existing options. It could be a breakthrough for renewable energy, according to lead researcher Dr. Shenlong Zhao at the University of Sydney. It says this, quote, our sodium battery has the potential to dramatically reduce costs while providing four times as much storage capacity as lithium. This is a significant breakthrough for renewable energy development, which, although reduces costs in the long term, has had several uh, beneficial batteries to enter it. Okay, why does this battery matter? As the climate heats up, there is an urgent need to switch to renewable energy sources like solar like wind and solar, but renewables are not always consistent as other sources, meaning batteries, are needed to store the electricity for later. Okay, and this is the thing. So, yeah, because they want to uh, achieve climate neutrality, whatever that means, and the EU requires 18 times more lithium than it currently uses by 2030. So, okay, so almost 60 times more by 2050. Okay, so they're expecting it's going to... Okay. Okay. There's a lot to be... Um, climate. Climate, 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 climate. There's so much to be said about that. Like the medieval warming period. And of much other things. But I'm, I'm not going to go there. Until the end. <laughs> Wee. So yeah, we've got a sea salt battery as an option. You know? I'm not even much about thorium reactors these days. But anyway, batteries. We're doing batteries. Doing batteries. Yeah, sea salt. That's crazy. What else? What else can we do? Linking off the back of that, I can make it even more crazy. So we've got red sand. Something a bit like sand. Salt, but totally different properties. That's something a bit like salt, but again different. How about a crystal? <gasps> crystals. What about crystals? What about crystal battery? 
so crystal bachelor i don't know if this is going to get him in trouble so i'm just going to move this it's on youtube john hutchinson you you heard of john hutchinson in my little close close circle probably heard of him uh yeah for those of not this guy i think this was canadian guy he's like a genius like inventor guy this is just a mad genius guy one of them i'll show you this quick thing because it's a um, it's just a like eight minute video. I'm just going to shorten it down, just show the end. Because this this guy, I remember reading about him. He's famed for doing. He's got a lot of uh, like hand me down navy grade electrical equipment. He's a scientist. He's done government work for U.S. and Canada, I do believe. But yeah, he's a government been a government contracted physicist. And John Hutchinson, famed for having a static field chamber, and he's firing in radio waves and different frequencies and getting all kinds of weird effects from materials, making them do weird stuff, like float and meld together and, you know, metal tearing. Like it's fibrous, just crazy. So yeah, it's fame for that, but it was just as impressive. I, found the, I thought these were impressive. They're kind of like crystal cells. So I'm just going to play this. I'm going to keep it muted. I'll just... Um, you never know. <laughs> I don't think there's any music on it, but... We'll just play it, look, because this guy... I just want you to see the guy so you can see him. John Hutchinson. I've got some links in. But he made these. I'll just pause the picture. He's made these. I'll just describe for those that are listening. So they look like flasks. He's got his table. He's got a, you know, a, oh, I forgot what they're called. Micrometer. Voltmeter. There's voltage meter reader things. He's got these things that look like flasks. It's like metal cases. And like got bolts strapped to the top. You know, attached to the top. Brass on the top. Metal whatnot so basically his idea was that he was making sand batteries kind of thing and and then he started thinking about how to make it more efficient in fact no, i'm just going to play it screw it let's listen to john Hutchinson. i think it'll be cool all right let me get him in I need to fade him up all right let's uh play this shooby dooby doo oh, fade the sound up in a sec Right, there we go. By resisting conventional wisdom, John has continued with his efforts to produce a simple solid state power cell from his adjustable prototype. The plates have to be charged and they have to move together. That's a bit of a problem. The moving together, I would use a tunable um, micrometer. And, but after a while, these, these, all these little plates would break down because of the heat and distortion and the pressure from the, from the um, little micrometer. So I had to think that what else could I do to have something that is usable, practical, then I thought of maybe taking all kinds of, almost like a dust of plates, platelets of germanium and other metals, and mixing them in, into a mineral mix with great heat to get any hydrous material out of them, and also at the same time as it's all cooling down, I would apply 20,000 volts drag current, then dropping it down to 45 uh, volts drag current. So the mem they're memorized. John continued. Comment on that bit. The memorized. You know, he said that. The memorized is, is adjusting the voltage for these crystals. He's programming them. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's like, it's almost like he's giving it an upper and lower limit. Of what, it's, what voltage to expect, so that then becomes the capacitor, sort of thing. Do you know what I'm saying? It's what it seems like what he's doing there, and with crystals. And I, uh, okay, it, it, it's, it tracks for me. We use crystals, quartz crystals, don't we, for so many things, a piece of electric crystals. In fact, that's radio. That's how you change the tuner on your radio. It's just, it's just squeezing a crystal as you squeeze it more, because up, you know, up and down. And you can squeeze crystals for to like modulate electrical signals because it's already creating one by the pressure of being squeezed. So if you have one running through it anyway, you know that you can add a voltage or release some depending on how much you squeeze it because you get an extra voltage from the crystal. So you know how much it's going to be. You know, it's... Ugh. So yeah, so crystal, it tracks. It tracks. And then, of course, I mentioned in the beginning of this show... When I first, you know, got into looking into this kind of stuff from YouTube and researching things, the crystal schools. 
and in the Crystal Schools in the documentary and in the book, it talks about how they were used to transfer consciousness. And they, and, and they literally witnessed, in the book, there's a picture of the Crystal Skull turned upside down. It's the Mitchell Hedges one, the famous one, the big one. The Mitchell Hedges Skull in the book is pictures where they said they filmed it and took pictures where they could it, like, they would get to show you things, like a video. It was showing you a video of a UFO in the skull. You turn it upside down, it's like a movie screen. And I was like, no way. This is my beginning of this stuff. This is the first thing I found out about. That you get crystal skulls that will show you movies and stuff, and then, you know, there's all this stuff, and then crystals, and found out that, you know, can store memory, and then shamans wanted to swap them over, and found out about the Baghdad battery as a little sweetener to let you know, oh, there's some proof for that one, and then Phil Schneider. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and start looking into, you know, 9-11 and Alex Jones and stuff. Some people put the documents up. Well, I tried to put them up, but yeah, people put documents up. I went and checked them out, I did. That's what I've been doing all this time. <laughs> but anyway. Anywho, anywho, let's just blast on through. Let's just blast on through. I was going to do a break, but screw it. <laughs> I was just sound about radio clock tonight this morning as well. But anyway, no, don't have to have a break. As long as it's not longer than an hour. So yeah, I thought that was weird. I thought that was weird. But I'm going to just let uh, John Hutchinson just explain the rest of this. Because, yeah, because what we're talking is the Casimir effect. And the Casimir effect was a proposed effect, I think, a Russian scientist. And then they weren't able to test it until, um, I don't think they were able to test it properly, the proof concept, until they were able to do machine at microns, you know, close. Because you need to have two metal plates that are charged close to each other, but so close that most of the electromagnetic spectrum can't fit between the plates. So it's only got tiny waveforms in between the plates because they're that close. Then when you charge them up, it should push the plates together. <laughs> right, which was the proof of concept that if you can get the plates that close to each other and then just let go of them, it should push them together because the waveforms outside of the plates are going to be bigger than the ones inside because they can't fit in there. So the waveform pressure should push them together, which is basically the proof of concept for um, zero-point energy. Right? And the, the concept of zero-point energy is that it's known that a centimetre, well, one-inch cube of space, and how put off you'd say is about a foot, and, you know... And, but a small amount of space, just empty space that's all around us, if you could tap the energy in it, there's enough energy density in there to, to run the planet for 100 years. It's a lot. In fact, Nassim Haramine did the calculations and said there's, there's more energy in a centimetre cube of space than compacting all the known universe into it. There's a lot of energy if you can tap it. There's a lot. This is why, I, this is why it annoys me about it. Energy crisis stuff. I'm hanging a minute. Hmm. Nah. What energy? We've not supposed to have one since decades ago, as far as I can tell. But zero point energy. So the thing about zero point energy, patent office, US patent office, and these are free energy devices. You can't get a patent for them and they don't get developed. Guess why? Because they break the first two laws of thermodynamics, apparently. Right? So no one can get a patent for this stuff. Okay, apart from, there's a, in fact, he can say himself, he can say the claim, John Hutchinson says this is himself. Yeah, look, I don't, I don't care if I get a strike. Listen to this. It's one cubic foot um, of it, of the space time right here now, right in front of us, around us. If you can capture that, there's enough energy in that um, block to um, power the Earth's energy needs for 100 years. Richard P. Feynman, uh, Nobel Prize winner, states a light bulb size piece. A U.S. patent was issued on technology based on this energy source. This is a significant event because the U.S. Patent Office clearly states it will not issue a patent for something it deems to be perpetual motion. There, it's interesting to note that uh, my competitor in, in this has a U.S. patent already, uh, Dr. Franklin Mead, who does know my research and if one was to study that patent um, through the United States Patent Office one would see it's 
very interestingly similar to my stuff. Hmm, sorry about the little delay there and getting the sound up. But yeah, very interestingly similar to my stuff. They won't do over Unity devices because it breaks, except for this uh, Franklin Mead guy. So, <laughs> let's let's look that up, shall we? And dun dun dun, guess what? Dude's telling the truth. <laughs> Here it is, look. Here's the pattern. So, links will be in the description. Here we go, for the, the video viewers. Franklin B. Mead Jr., US pattern 5590031. System for converting electromagnetic radiation to electrical energy. All right, that's what it says on the pattern. Here we go, that's the one he's referring to. All right, okay. <laughs> so there we are. So we've got zero point energy pattern even though that is supposed to violate the first two laws of thermodynamics. So what are they? <laughs> what are they? Let's have a look. I was going to go Wikipedia, but then I thought, no, it's Encyclopedia Britannica. Thank you very much, sir. So Encyclopedia Britannica. I didn't know that uh, the law of thermodynamics had a zero law. Zeroth law. They must have forgot one and then didn't want to change the numbers. Anyway, so the first law of thermodynamics or the law of conservation of energy is it the one I thought they was going to say well, you can't get you can't get something from nothing <laughs> don't don't talk to eastern philosophers about that okay so first law of thermodynamics says that the law of conservation of energy or it's called as well is um, a change in a system's internal energy is equal to the difference between the heat added to the system from its surroundings and work done by the system on its surroundings. Okay. There's always going to be energy loss, basically. That's what that means. Can't get anything for nothing. Right, second law of thermodynamics. Heat does not flow spontaneously from a colder region to a hotter region. Or equivalently, heat at a given temperature cannot be converted entirely into work, as in there's always going to be some loss. Okay. Consequently, the entropy of a closed system or heat per unit temperature increases over time towards the maximum value. Thus, all closed systems tend toward an equilibrium state in which entropy is at a maximum and no energy is available to do useful work. A way to think of that is put a marble in a bowl um, just right on the bridge and just drop it in the bowl, let it roll down, and it will roll around and do whatever, and, and then eventually it's going to rest at the bottom and go, Whoosh, and then eventually it run out of energy and just kind of sit at the bottom. And they're saying that's what things tend to do. You can't have these things keep running. Whatever. But at the same time, they say that, and then they give us a... But then they give Franklin Mead a pattern for some reason, and his colleague. So that's weird. I'm not saying that just for the, the video viewers and just for transparency and whatnot. Yeah, all the zero point energy. This is a real thing. It's on Wikipedia. Links will be in the description. Zero point energy, the lowest possible energy point at a quantum mechanical system may have. Unlike in classical mechanics, quantum systems constantly fluctuate in the lowest energy state as described by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Therefore, even at absolute zero, atoms and molecules retain some vibrational motion. Apart from atoms and molecules, the empty space of the vacuum also has these properties. According to quantum field theory, the universe can be th thought of as not as isolated particles, but as a continuous fluctuating fields, matter fields whose quanta and fermions, i.e. leptons and quarks, and force fields whose quanta or bosons, e.g. photons and gluons, all these fields have zero-point energy. And that's like saying, there's tons of energy everywhere, we just need to tap it. So why have we spent a century faffing around, pretending, is my question, because I think that's what's going on. Going on just... They've been blagging us. They've been blagging us. And guess what? Boom Shankar, even though it's just even though that, that pattern uh, which was issued in 
1996, uh, Franklin B. Mead, patent, US patent 5590031, even though it violates for, you know, laws of thermodynamics, patent office still gave it, and then Bumshenko, another one. Hey, just over a decade later, 11 years later, when's this? Another patent, US patent 7379286 was granted on May the 27th, 2008. So there we go. But again, that's uh, US patent 7379286. There we go. Quantum Energy gets a patent. That's from energycentral.com. So yeah, a system of a system is disclosed of converting energy uh, from the electromagnetic uh, quantum vacuum available at any point in the universe to usable energy in the form of heat, electricity, mechanical energy, or in other forms of power. Quantum quantum vacuum. And there was Adam mentioned the fluctuations in the previous one. That's what it is. You sometimes hear that term. It's stringing it together. Quantum. Uh, vacuum fluctuations like Alan Watts used to say everything wiggles man everything wiggles you know look at the 20s when tried to make women straight it, it makes me laugh as well it made everyone straight didn't it made everyone the suits man and the guys and everyone's straight and it's like nah nah and you watch the Hindus dancing in a very like effeminate way and they're all over the place and, duh, 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 duh. man and that's like that's like more real isn't it <laughs> And, and I literally, being a raver and a DJ, I remember going to raving for the first time at a proper rave, and it hit me that my hips work, literally. I literally did what Alan Watts was on about. It was, you know, your hips move, the normal thing of dancing. It's the, the, you wiggle. I was like, oh, yeah. It's hit me one day. Oh, yeah, they work. And then all of a sudden you can dance and you feel normal. It's crazy. Get rid of the stiffness. Anywho, unless you're pulled at the end of the night, then that, you want the stiffness, don't you? <clears throat> Anywho. Yeah, quantum uh, fluctuations, quantum vacuum fluctuations. So yeah, zero point energy is a thing, and it's in two, it's two patents for it. So that means the principle works, and all these over unity devices, and that they might be for real. Then a lot of them have been shown themselves can't get a patent, but they are issuing patents, even though they're saying they're not for this very thing. You know what I'm saying? A quick browser search just find find that straight away. So wait, so I'm not saying what? So zero point energy has been around since at least the 90s, right? Would have had to have been developed before that to get there, to get the patent in 96. So another decade later, they've got another patent comes out, right? So they've had, this, so they must have developed it for a bit, get the patent in 96 and a good 10 years to work on it. You know what I'm saying? So, so, and, but still, physicists are still telling us it's impossible. Do you know what I mean? Oh, so what is it? Have we got zero-point energy systems clearly, you know, shown, demonstrated with the 90s and 2000 patents, right? So so why blag it for a quarter of a century? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Because look, look, almost a quarter of a century, right? We've In, in the public commercials and sector, we've, we can't help but notice how rapidly technology is moving on and consumer grade, right? We can't help but notice. So and that's just at the consumer grade, not even to mention Moore's Law, which now I've mentioned it, I'll have to put it up. <laughs> but Moore's Law, the doubling of transistors every couple of years. You just get, you know, computers just get faster and faster due to Moore's Law. That will be in the description. Pretty well known. It's an old thing, 1965. So, yeah. Yeah, so there's no way. There's no way they haven't figured this stuff out. If they got it back in the 90s, they got it by now. They totally must have it by now. Do you know what I'm saying? So, anyway. But back to batteries. Uh, five new ones. Five new technologies. Five new revolutionary battery technologies. I don't... I think we haven't mentioned any of these yet either. So, number one. In at number one. Do -do 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 -do. Let's take a look. What's new? Let's have a few. Number one. Nano bolt lithium tungsten batteries. Working on battery anode materials, researchers at N1 Technologies Inc. added tungsten and carbon multi-layered nanotubes that bond to the copper anode substrate and build up a web-like nanostructure that, 
This forms a, a huge surface for more ions to attach to during recharge and discharge cycles. That makes recharging the nanobolt lithium tungsten battery faster and also stores more energy. Nanotubes are ready to be to cut the size and use of a lithium battery design. Number two, zinc magnesium oxide batteries. How does a battery actually work? Investigating um, uh, conventional assumptions, the team based at uh, DOE specific Northwest lab Laboratories found unexpected chemical conversion reactions in a zinc magnesium oxide battery. If that process can be controlled, it can increase energy density in a conventional battery without increasing cost. This makes the zinc magnesium oxide battery a possible alternative to lithium ion or lead acid, flooded lead acid batteries, especially in a large scale energy storage support for the nation's national grid. So, so just switching the chemistry up with that and they'd be doing that with lithium ion. They've been adding a phosphate recently as well, getting um, instead of hundreds of charge cycles, getting thousands. So that's coming on. Okay, it's all chemistry stuff. Uh, in at number three, organosilicon, electrolyte battery. A problem with lithium batteries is the danger of the electrolyte catching fire or exploding. It's unlikely. I'll just point that out. But there is a possibility of that. It does happen sometimes, but mostly pretty safe. It's not pointing that out here, but anyway. Searching for something safer that is than the carbonate-based solvent systems lithium-ion batteries, University of uh, Wisconsin Madison Chemistry Professor Robert Hammers and Robert West developed this OS-based liquid solvent. The resulting electrolytes can be engineered at a molecular level for industrial, military, and consumer lithium-ion battery markets. So we've got another one there. Number four, this sounds pretty cool. Gold nanowire gel electrolyte batteries. So gel batteries, they're, they're used usually for um, when there's a lot of vibration, like uh, vehicles and stuff, uh, quad bikes and that. You know, it's like all sealed in sort of thing. So yeah, golden nanowire gel electrolyte batteries in the number four. Also seeking a better electrolyte for lithium ion batteries, researchers at the University of uh, California, Irvine, experimented with gels, which are not as uh, combustible as liquids. They tried coating gold nanowires with magnesium oxide, like the other people, and um, you know, then covering them with the electrolyte gel. While nanowires are usually too delicate to used in batteries, these had become resilient. When the researchers charged the resulting electrode, they discovered that it went through 200,000 cycles without losing its ability to hold charge. That compares to 6,000 cycles of a conventional battery. Wow, that's a lot. That is a lot more. That's pretty good. Okay, and that will be a, a PMMA, gel electrolyte layer, a gold content yeah, there's a little picture that if you want to check it out, links in the description. This is from uh, www.gray.com. Uh, five new battery technologies. And then the fifth one, last but not least, Tank 2 string cell batteries. Uh, string cell TM, it's trademark. A barrier to use the electric vehicles, EVs, is the slow recharging process. Seeking a way to turn hours into minutes, Tank 2 looked into modulizing a battery the string cell battery contains a collection of small independent self-organizing cells each string cell consists of a plastic enclosure covered with conductive material that allows it to quickly and easily form contacts with others an internal processing unit controls the connections and the electromagnet uh, electrochemical cell let me read that again an internal processing unit controls the connections and the electrochemical cell. To facilitate quick charging of an EV, the little balls contained in the battery are sucked out and swapped for, for recharged cells at the service station. At the station, the cells can be recharged at off-peak hours. So it sounds like it's saying it's made of lots of little bits that you can remove that will do the charging, but you can take the bits out when they're not charged and put new balls in, and then those bits can just sit around waiting to be charged when it's convenient, like some of this uh, excess dumping of solar and wind energy. So we can combine them two together. You know what I'm saying? You get these sand things set up because they're cheap, 
and whack some of these in. The sand ones have to stay in place, but if you get some of these little pellet things are random, you could ship them out as energy cells that have been recharged. Hmm. So combine some of this stuff. Oh, yeah. So that's that's another one then. And then uh, one last one quick before we uh, wrap up. And I want to get this guy in as well because he's a British. Hey, ex-Navy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ex-Navy guy. Check this guy. Nice. This could be us. This could be one of you people listening, man. Ex-Navy engineer built car battery with a a 1,500-mile range. Battery inventor Trevor Jackson has just signed a deal with Austin Motor Company to scale up production of his creation. There we go. This is the guy. There's Trev. Trevor Jackson. A former Navy officer turned inventor has developed a revolutionary new type of battery capable of powering an electric car for 1,500 miles at a time. British engineer Trevor Jackson created the battery and has, has now signed a multi-million pound deal with Austin Electric, an engineering firm based in Essex, to start mass production, mass producing them. According to Austin's chief executive, Danny Corcoran, the new technology is a game changer, in quotes. It can help trigger the next industrial revolution, he told Mail Online. The advantages over traditional electrical batteries are enormous. I got your enormous right here. So, yeah, so. Could be another game changer. So, I don't know. So, yeah, it's looking good with the batteries at least. So, at least if they keep faffing us around and making us wait years for the Lawrence Livermore fusion reactor, at least we can start storing stuff a bit on the cheap. You know what I mean? I think that's how we're going to have to do it for a couple of years, I reckon. Or at least prepare to maybe have to look after each other and do stuff like this. We've got to get inventive, haven't we? You know, I think that's the way it's got to go. Because, like I say, I mean, there's more to cover with this because, you know, these, you have to mine these chemicals and things like that anyway. It can be environmentally damaging and whatnot. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about this stuff. And, uh, yeah, hydrogen power cars, I mean, I ain't got time to cover it. But, yeah, do you know they've been around? Hydrogen power cars have been around for 100 years. It's crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'll just quickly put the picture on just so you can see. Yeah, look, look at that. 18, 1802. First one. Big list of them. Anyway, links in the description. So I want to go tight to this clock on the on the hour because I want to make sure. Um, I'd rather go a bit short than a bit over. I'm blasting through the middle break. That was just practice anyway. <laughs> but anyway, yes. Yeah. I'm glad Chance uh, put this onto this one, so... Yeah, I hope you've enjoyed enjoyed the show. <laughs> Same, uh, strive to keep trying to improve. I might say, we'll uh, see how this all works out going forward. But yeah, hopefully, should be pretty uh, pretty all right. But anyway, anyway, Exile Minds podcast. Liam Martin we'll back again tomorrow. Not sure what we're doing tomorrow. Might do a might do black goop, I think. Falkman's war. Anyway, you take it easy folks, look after yourself. No one would have believed in the early years of the 21st century. Our world was being watched by intelligences greater than our own. Gulf of Space, Intellects.